So Francesca, I've just met you actually just a few weeks ago and Francesca is a Michelin star chef um, and we're going to be talking to Francesco about his love and passion of food because I found Francesco and he has been cooking for a patient of mine who I've been looking after who needs a low residue diet and that, as you possibly know, is a diet where you can't have any roughage or any foods that sort of challenge the gut too much. So Francesco, how did you get into food and where does your passion and love of food come from? So basically my food, uh, my passion for the food is born when I was kids, doing around, you know, cooking with my mom or with my grandmother. You, when you are Italian kids, you are always, uh, you live your life in the kitchen. So you are about the smell of your grandmother when he's doing, uh, when you wake up in the morning, she is already doing the sauce for the lunch and that he let me feel in love with the cooking and I continue I continue my career about the food from that. And how old were you roughly then when you realised you really wanted to be a chef? Basically when I realised that was around 12, 13 years old. I was very young but you know in, in Italy you need to choose at 14 years old which school you want to do it and uh, I decided to become a chef. Gosh, so you went to a special school? Yeah, I went to a special school for uh, be a chef. It's uh, like kind of a high school in Italy but it's uh, yeah, a specific school. Where was that? In Fuji, it's close to Rome, it's about 70 kilometers from Rome. Right. Yeah. So you, you like, you sleep there for the whole week, it's like a five days a week, you go the Monday, you go the Friday. Yeah, and the weekend you are at home, so you have time for work and for do something else. So how long did you do that for? Five years. Gosh. Yeah. And then where did you go from Italy? So where, take me on your little food journey as to where you cooked and how did you Yeah, I started to cook uh, in Italy, I mean a bit around, like I started in Fuji, uh, doing my own town in uh, Villa Adriana, Tivoli, Rome. After when I moved to Rome, uh, you start to see the world is a bit bigger. And when you get into that, I, start, I leave and I went to work in France. After France, I went to work in London. I spent like a year and a half in London. After that, I moved to Hong Kong. And after working in Hong Kong, I moved to San Francisco for almost one year. And then I went back to London from the past two years. Gosh. Yeah. And do you love it? Yeah, I love it, yeah. more you travel, more you like it, what you're doing, because you always can discover new things, new technique, new flavor, new people. So that's a very interesting part of my job. Yeah, because I find that, you know, people ask, you know, with, like, they presume, we just talk always about healthy eating, but as you know, with so many of my patients, they're people who are vulnerable, and they're people who have really got challenges, but, you know, I think similarly, that passion of food means that you just find those beautiful ingredients that yeah. just when you combine them in a particular way, then they just turn someone's palate. That's around. the secret of the food. You need to have a beautiful ingredient before to start to make a beautiful dish. You want to make a beautiful spaghetti with tomato. If you have the quality of the tomato that is not good, yeah. you need the best product for me, the best dish all the way. And that, um, even like with the tomato, um, I think we, in the early days of looking after this patient, it's sort of understanding that you can't have the the skin of the tomato and you can't have the pip of the tomato yeah. and therefore people historically would say well you can't have tomato at all but it doesn't mean that because you make a really yeah you can find a nice way to make a nice spaghetti with tomato but without skin and without seeds yeah. well that is uh, was one of the recipes that uh, our patients she loved it it's just the secret you need to remove the skin from uh, cold you remove all the seeds you make a little brunoise of that you cook very gently with olive oil uh, with a little bit of onion you use very well good salt and after you can add a uh, um, tomato puree, she can have that, so you can put a little bit of that, you add some water. At the end you can put all the herbs that you want, the basic parts, the important part, that at the end you can remove it. Yeah. After you cook your pasta, you put inside the sauce and you finish with some parmesan and olive oil and it's just beautiful. Yeah, it is, because it's, I think people also, are they're frightened of using herbs and spices and and as you just said, you know, with herbs, often you can't leave the herbs in at the end yeah. because they can cause a problem with the gut, but yeah. um, you, we just infuse the flavour and you take them out. I mean, you can take all the flavour of the basil, it's beautiful to have just, uh, sometimes you have just the smell, you have the aroma, but you don't have the, the green part of this in your past, you know, like, uh, this is a perfect deal when you cook for the kids, you know, that uh, they maybe they like the basil, but if they see a bit of green, they don't want it that, so they, you put inside and after you remove it, you will just feed it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what were the other things that you found that she particularly loved? But basically what she particularly loved is like to have uh, all this kind of soup to make the, uh, to cook the fish and to add the fish in the soup. Let's see, like a, a sweet potato soup with uh, tuna pan fried. 
So the, she like the fish very cook. So you need to pan fry that, you pan fry it after you dice it and you have your pumpkin soup that you can put a bit of cardamom inside, uh, kaffir, lime, kaffir lime leaves inside and you can give all this flavor and then you can put your fish and uh, it becomes like a soup but it's flavorful. When you eat it, uh, you have the sweet of the potatoes, you have the, uh, the strong flavor of the tuna pan fried and you have the acidity that it can be given from the kaffir lime leaves. Again, I think it's just, it's, if you've got really good ingredients, and it's just investing in those good ingredients, but it could be particularly at times of the year when you can't get the fresh peas, you can use frozen peas and you yeah. can make a really simple, gorgeous pesto with that. But it's knowing it's a really good parmesan that you have with it. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be expensive, but it's actually knowing how to use those. How to use them, yeah. how to buy yours. Sometimes we need to remember how to buy the produce. That is the most important part. And where do you think the British go wrong with their buying of their food? Sorry? Where do you think the British go wrong with their buying of their food? Well, you know, sometimes I think uh, uh, on England you have too many products that are ready to eat. I think already when you start to buy like uh, tomatoes was ready, bologna was ready, this is already wrong because you don't know what there is inside. Because sometimes we don't lose too much time uh, to prep our food because we are busy, we don't have time, or we don't know how to do it. But sometimes we should spend a bit more time to do our our bolognese and I can tell you that for sure it will test different. Yeah. And it's that misnomer that people have that really delicious, gorgeous food takes a long time, yeah. but it doesn't. You know, yes, I found, you know, I love those days when you can go to the market on a Saturday and you spend the whole yes, day cooking. Yeah, that's and that's beautiful. beautiful. But then there are other times when you just get home and you do want to do a simple pasta dish. But it just takes literally 10 minutes, and that's the misnomer that I think for anyone, whether you're. And when well you eat, it will taste so, so different. Yeah. It's something that you research from the beginning to the end, so it will make you proud of what you've done, no? Yes. Yeah. It is, and also not being afraid to use things like salt, because that we have the sort of salt police, and they say, you know, you mustn't have too much salt. And yes, for some people, if they high, have high blood pressure, they can't have too much salt, because if they're sensitive to that salt, then that can cause their blood pressure to go up. But so many people aren't sensitive to salt. And I think if you strip out salt, you strip out flavour. Yes. And then yeah, it tastes so. bland yeah. and then you end up overeating and then you gain weight because your eating just food doesn't satiate you. So yeah. I think it's crazy. So it's not being afraid of using things like salt. Which sort of salt do you use in your cooking? Uh, sea salt. Yeah. Yeah. Especially mild on sometimes. Yeah, that's a good one. That is good for uh, finish to seasoning your food. You can test it through the salt, you need to test salt. It gives you the, how do you say, the spring to the food, you know, you bring the food to another level. Because if you test a very good piece of meat without salt, it will test good, but it's not good enough. If you put a good piece of salt, it will test much, much better. Yeah. yeah. And then you just need a small amount of it because you're satiated. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't need to over exaggerate with the, with the products. You need to find always the right balance. You don't need to less, you don't need too much. Is that the secret? Because sometimes if you don't put salt, I mean, it's, a, it's not salt at all, but you don't need to put too much. No, just a little. And then with meat, when you have a low residue diet, or anyone that's just, that finds meat hard to digest, I think it's classically, you find it hard to digest if you have a big piece of meat okay, on your, yeah, yeah that's not pro properly cooked. Whereas if you, I mince. find it, yeah, yeah, mince, either mince it or really slowly cook it. And so then, you cook and yeah. cut on very very small dice, after we will use to seasoning with some cumin, yeah. with some rosemary, with the uh, uh, onion, everything you have to be small, uh, you say you need to be cooked for a long time, because as a small piece it need to become tender, yeah. because uh, when you cannot digest it, because it's, uh, it can be hard and yeah, it can be difficult for yourself, but if it's long long cook, uh, cut very small, you will digest that for sure fine. And then when... Um Particularly, it's getting someone's confidence out with something like meat. So, with other patients, I find that if you have the, the meat and you have the lovely broth, and then you just start with a little bit of the broth, a little bit of the soft meat, and then they build up their confidence, and then you can move on to the minced meat or something that's really soft. Yeah. So, it's so much about confidence, about having the knowledge of what the body can tolerate and what it can't. So, one of the things I also find for some patients is that when you have to follow something like a low residue diet or a diet that's um, different for like a swallowing reason or um, a texture that you're having to make is that they think that they just have to have 
their one particular meal on their own and they can't share something. But it, and it could be really isolating because probably like your background and my family background, it's about sharing food and having that shared experience that brings around, you know, an, an appetite for food. Um, so I've always wanted to find dishes that um, patients can share with their loved ones. So it could be a souffle if you have a low residue diet or risotto or um, what, what are the sort of things that you would share with your family? Yeah, it's like, you know, to make uh, the big lasagna, as we, we used to do that on Sunday, you know, you make the lasagna, you share in the house, you share everyone together, or polenta, we used to put the polenta in the big uh, wooden board, and we're gonna use uh, everyone, you're gonna eat with the spoon there, and at the end it will be like the piece of polenta on the middle, and it will uh, look like something all the time, you're gonna have a little design, you're gonna trust that, because maybe you never did that, but all the time that you have a little piece of polenta in the board, it will look like a, I don't know, like a hurt, like a peach, like a something, for sure. And, uh, and with the polenta, do you tend to do the like this really loose, really loose, loose yeah, polenta? Really because loose. I mean, um, I think my first experience of polenta was just like rock solid, like blancmange. No, it's just like you need to be very creamy, but the creamy is is been uh, about the flavor, the flavor of the polenta. Because it basically just cook with the water and at yeah. the end you can put wherever you want, you put parmesan, you put butter. We used to finish that with tomato sauce and maybe sausage, maybe uh, uh, pork ribs and all this kind of meat. But uh, when you cook the polenta, just water and the polenta. Yeah. That's it. And then just keep it really slack. Yeah. Because I think people just think, and especially when you're you're worried about your intestine, is that they think if they're gonna, it looks like cement that they're going to put yeah. down. If it's like that really thick, horrible... Um, a sort of solid thing, whereas if you really make it loose with the yeah, butter, loose, yeah. yeah, then it's gorgeous. And then you can use the say a little bit of olive oil, that side of things. So it's just about finding those connecting dishes that are suitable for you when you have low residue or swallowing difficulty, but also you can share with your family, yeah, because there's no reason there are so many gorgeous things. Yeah, there is so many good things. I mean, it's, it's not like because yeah, it's a lot of you do, you don't eat or you bet is a. Uh, I mean, it's different for the beginning, it's a, it's a little bit different because everyone, when you eat a piece of tomato, you like to eat the seeds. I mean, you used to get the tomato, you put on the bread, you eat like this, but you can also find a good way to eat the tomato without seeds and skin. Yeah. yeah. It is, it's about a secret. And all of your travels in the world, have you had any sort of real amazing light bulb moments of gorgeous things that you've discovered? Yeah, I mean, uh, like when I've been in Asia, you can discover a totally different culture of people. You start from the food, from the people to the lifestyle. Everything is different. It's, it's nothing to see with our culture. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to discover the products. It's beautiful to discover the people. It's, uh, I mean, it's, when you arrive there, you will not believe that. You say, this is another world where I live until now. And, uh, but this is the same thing, so what they think about us, you know. So you've got, how many Michelin stars have you got? Actually, I didn't got exactly the Michelin star. I worked for a lot of chefs that they got the Michelin star, and now we're working on it for get my own Michelin star. Ah, where we're were gonna you? go to the next project that they're gonna be in charge, and uh, hopefully you're gonna do well. Yes, and that's going to be in San Francisco, yes. isn't it? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, it was a pleasure to be with you. Yeah.